Um, I had 25 years as a trader in financial markets uh, from the mid-80s. Um, at the time, I was working for a Japanese bank, and they gave me my first trading uh, book and started letting me trading on the second week of October 1987, which was, um, for those of you familiar with Black Monday, it was quite a baptism by fire. Um, from then, I moved to a small Norwegian bank in the late 80s, um, where I was able to learn my art a little bit further and take it a little bit further. From there, I moved to Credit Suisse, um, where I was trading both uh, in financial markets, FX, derivative, interest rate, derivatives, fixed income, um, broad range of products, actually, uh, both in terms of basis trading and propriety trading. I then moved to Commerce Bank in the late 90s, and um, my, last, my last proper job at a bank was in 2003. I moved to American Express Bank, and then we were acquired by Standard Charter Bank. So I spent uh, a year there, but within the same business. So it's, it's quite a rounded trading experience within that time. Um, I've now, since 2009, I've been working as a coach. Uh, probably the biggest influence in my own trading career was when I had my own coach in 2001. Um, Commerce Bank offered me the services, services as a, of an executive coach, which are really to help you develop yourself as a manager and leader, but I actually found it incredibly useful to develop me as a trader, helping me become more self-aware um, of myself and my, my own proclivities and tendencies and uh, my own behaviour aspects. And it was really from that point on that my own trading actually went into, uh, into a sharp, uh, sharp acceleration um, in the following years. Uh, I finished in 2009, decided I was going to leave the markets and become a coach myself, uh, following a conversation with my own coach, who I'd stayed in touch with with all those years. Um, I've always been fascinated in the, in the psychology side of trading, the, be the behavioural side of trading. What makes people tick? And it, you know, I, I was lucky enough, to, I think, to have spent 25 years working in a, in a psychology lab, which was uh, which were the trading rooms I spent my time in. So, um, and I've always been passionate about trading. So it gave me a chance to bring both my my interest in people and my interest in trading psychology and my interest in trading into one space. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to move on into the presentation. Um, the, the graphic up here, the first graphic, um, the quote that probably, one of the quotes that underscores my philosophy um, to my work as a trading coach, a performance coach, is it's not the mountain we conquer, but ourselves. Uh, now I slightly adapt that for trading, it's not the market we conquer, it's ourselves. And I think most of you are familiar that, with the idea that often we get in our own way. You know, actually, if we didn't have any risk on, we'd probably be much better, we call the market very well. And I, I meet people who tell me this the whole time. They call the market brilliantly, but they don't always monetize their ideas very well. So that, that, that quote um, really catches, really sums it up. Um, just very quickly, a little bit of, house, little bit of housekeeping, just a, a disclaimer from CMC Markets, which uh, some of you are very quick at reading, you can very quickly look through that. Um, and I'm going to move on, unless anyone wants me to stay on that, that page. Okay, so another quote which informs my work, um, a quote by Daniel Kahneman, who uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. He's the Nobel Prize winner in economics, um, often considered to be the godfather of, uh, of behavioural finance. Uh, he says we are, we're blind to our blindness. And again, this is something else which I find when I coach traders, when I work with traders, when I work with teams, is that actually the very things that are holding us back, we can't even see. They're not visible to us. So exploring and becoming more self-aware is part of that journey. When I find that people become aware of some of their blindnesses, their performance starts to improve. How do you find those blindnesses? It's not easy, but it's part of the journey of self-awareness. And part of the problem is, that, as Daniel Kahneman says, you know, we have not evolved to actually to be able to understand how little we know. And, uh, and we're not designed to know that. Uh, one final quote, um, which is a quote, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, with the work of Sun Tzu, the, uh, the ancient Chinese general who wrote, uh, wrote the uh, legendary Art of War, which is studied even today by military experts, strategists, and business people. 
Um, and, and within that, he has this quote, that if you know the enemy and know yourself, you, don't need, you need not fear the results of 100 battles. And the enemy is the market. It's the rest of the people competing. It's all the people here. Collectively, they are the market, they're a representation of the market, and it's a broader market. That is the enemy. But if you know yourself, then you start to, you have a greater chance of winning. And that's again something we find, that's a philosophy which, which goes through our work. And just to, uh, just to expand to that point, most people know their enemy pretty well. Most people know their market. After a few years studying it, they're familiar with it. And as I speak to people, when they go back to paper trading, they start to get direction right again. But suddenly when they come back into it, and it turns out they don't really know themselves that well, and that person, as in the first one, tends to get in the way. Now, I'm going to focus on, this, this talk really is about knowing yourself, understanding yourself. It's a talk about trading psychology, but with a bit of a difference. We tend not to focus on trading psychology, but we focus on knowing your own psychology. That's the important difference here. There's lots of books out there about trading psychology. There's lots you'll read about it. It's all interesting information. It's great information. But often what happens is people say, I'm going to make an adjustment. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to try and not let my loss aversion affect me. I'm not going to let my own discipline stop me. I'm going to be more disciplined. And then weeks later, months later, all those steps they've taken, they often haven't worked, where they've had a small effect. And the reason is, it's about how it affects you. So it's about knowing your own psychology rather than psychology per se. And I'm going to introduce you to a tool called the Risk Type Compass. And I'm going to first explain what Risk Type is. And then I'm going to tell you how that tool works. Um, and then I'm going to show you some research we've done with that tool on traders in banks and hedge funds and energy firms, showing people's proclivities um, as traders and how that affects the decisions they make. So, what are some of the benefits of knowing about yourself? Obviously, the top one here is improving trading and investment performance. But also, within that, learning to understand your strengths and weaknesses, becoming more risk aware, understanding how risk affects you in your decisions, uh, understanding your limitations, which is a very important point. A lot of the people who have been most successful, we find they're able to leverage their strengths and also reduce their weaknesses and limit reduce the effect of their limitations on them. And to put a trading strategy or model that really works within that. And I'll show you some examples of traders of different types, different risk types, who have been able to brilliantly um, leverage their own particular strengths and limit their own weaknesses. And they might be completely different to what you'd expect a successful trader to be. Um, so that helps build a more robust trading approach. It helps to improve your understanding of other people. Now, for often, for many people, seeing the reactions of people around them is one of the greatest indicators of what's about to happen in the market. So if you can start to understand other people a little bit more and see their own reactions, that's news and information to you as a trader. Um, and uh, finally, contextualising your, your behaviours. It, it's, it's very helpful for that. There are other benefits. I'm not going to go through those now as I'm, I'm keen to move on, but uh, we can repeat, I'll repeat this slide a little bit later on. So, so what is risk type? Now risk type is really risk personality. And risk personality, core risk personality, is anchored. We can change our risk behaviours, we can adopt different attitudes and different beliefs, but our core risk personality doesn't change. Rather like in this diagram, the boat can move around on the water, pushed around by transient events, the winds, the tides, the currents. But your risk type is anchored to one place. You would have had the same risk type 20 years ago, and you all you may certainly be the same risk type 20 years from now. You can't change your risk type. It's natural to you. It's innate to you. You were born with it. And to a degree, it evolved in your early years. Your early experiences would have helped shape it. So it's a mixture of your innate habits, your innate um, characteristics, and habits that you built up in your early years. So changing risk type, that doesn't really move. And just to make, uh, to expand on that, risk behaviour is really a result of risk type, your personality, and a result of the attitudes which can change throughout your life through learning, through experiences, through, through, through 
what you see other people do um, through your own study. But risk type, as we say, that, that stays constant. Um, as we say, the boat, if you're watching this from ashore, you'd see the boat, which is your risk attitudes. And that moves around a little bit by the wind, the tides, but it can't move too far. Um, now, we, what we found is that if your attitude to risk, your behaviours that you adopt, um, and your beliefs are similar or close to your risk type, as in this example, um, you start to make better decisions. You start to make more optimal decisions and more optimal choices. Um, you're less likely to be affected by default decision making, um, such as behavioural biases um, and irrational actions. And we tend to see it above par performance when people are trading in a way that's close to their risk type. However, when they get pushed or, or steer too far away from their risk type and are adopting behaviours and practices which don't really suit them, then that, that chain between their risk type and the boat becomes stretched, it becomes stressed. Um, and we find that in those situations, people are making suboptimal choices. Their decision making is impaired. And they're more likely to be affected by default decisions, behavioural biases, uh, irrational actions. And that leads to subpar performance. Now, obviously, this is quite a simplified analogy. Um, it works for this purpose, but um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but that is the theory of risk type. So I'm going to move on to the risk type compass now, which is the tool I use in my coaching. I work with traders, as I say, inside banks. Um, I work with traders inside hedge funds. Uh, I work with some private traders. I work with managers. I work with teams. So this, this works for teams as well, and we work with groups as well, helping them understand their risk type. So this is a risk personality tool which we've been using um, in recent years, or over the past sort of year and a half. And this is the main graphic that you will see us using that is presented to people when they take the risk type compass. And it identifies every one of one of eight different risk types, all with unique risk characteristics. So from the top, you've got the wary type. As you move around to the left, you've got the intense type, the excitable type, the carefree type, adventurous, calm and composed, uh, deliberate, prudent. Um, without going into too much explanation, I'm sure the words probably capture the nature of each risk type. Um, and within the middle, you have uh, what's called the axis group, which is people that don't really have a, a clearly defined risk type. They can actually be a little bit of everything, um, but not, not a strong form of anything. Now, just to give you a little bit more insight into the risk type campus, it's a personality assessment. It was created by um, a group of occupational psychologists, um, and it, it helps people understand differences in the way individuals perceive, manage, and make decisions in risk situations, high risk situations, of which, of course, trading is one of those situations. Um, it's based off uh, decades of research into personality assessment. Um, and if you know anything about uh, psychology or your trade in psychology, you'll probably be familiar with the five-factor model, which is, uh, which is a model, as we say, formed over many decades, which identifies people, uh, personality characteristics. Now, what the, um, the, the creators of this tool have done is they've, they've found which of those factors correlate to the way people make decisions in risky situations. So they've stripped out the uncorrelated aspects of the five-factor model, just let in the aspects which relate to risk. Um, now, this has been road tested thoroughly. Um, actually, it's on over 10,000 individuals now, and it's, it's proven to be highly reliable. Um, now, it wasn't actually created for traders. It was originally created um, at the request of a wealth management firm who wanted to use it as part of their KYC processes. Um, they found that, um, that the methods which had been suggested by the FCA, the, F the FSA in those days, um, and created by their own risk managers to help know people were really too subjective. And this is a far more objective, uh, objective process. The questions behind it are standard questions. You're asked to select one of, from 45 different questions, one of three different answers. So it's an objective process. So I'm going to move back now to the risk compass. Um, if you took this test, you would see your type denoted by a red circle and where you appear on this axis. Um, now we find, from our work with it, that there's certain characteristics which are starting to show up 
from where people are on this, on, this, uh, on this campus. So the closer you are to the top, the more you tend to have a defensive or tactical bias. The closer you are to the bottom, the more you have a purposeful or strategic bias. Again, looking across the horizons of this graphic, the further out to the right, the more you tend to be objective and methodical in how you make decisions. The further you are to the left, the more you tend to be subjective and arbitrary um, using intuition in your decision making. Um, one other point to notice, the further you are to the edge, the closer you are to the edge, um, the more you tend to be a strong form of the risk type. The closer you are to the middle, a weaker form. And as we said in the middle, in the access group, you're not really denoted as one particular risk type. Now when you take this test, where you appear on this graphic, um, as we say, you're going to appear on here roughly in the same spot in 20 years time. If you'd have taken this test 20 years ago, roughly you would have appeared in the same spot. I'm sure there's a little bit of variance. On a certain day you might answer one or two questions slightly differently, answer slightly differently depending on your mood, but not very much. So we find that, you know, you may be a bit higher, a bit lower, a bit further left, a bit further right, but you're always going to be in roughly the same general region when you take this test. So, here we have the graphic. You have an example of someone who's the intense type. Um, they tend to be more defensive and more tactical in their trading. They tend to be more subjective and arbitrary. What does that mean? Well, people who are more defensive and more tactical tend to have a lower risk tolerance. They tend to have a bias to be more risk averse. On the other hand, people with a more purposeful strategic approach, they naturally, they're the other side, they have a higher risk tolerance, higher risk seeking bias. Again, on decision making, people who are further to the left, tend to be more intuitive in their decision making, more use of gut in how they make decisions. On the right hand side, people tend to be have more of a logic focus. They like to see evidence. So the intuitive, the, the, the intense person here, these characteristics would make them, as we say, they'd be more risk averse and more intuitive as a trader. And we'll see some of the patterns which start to show up when I'll show you the data from the research we've done on traders. But just to explain further what this means, and obviously I've not shown you the whole graphic here, but we, we put together a graphic based on behaviours we've, we've witnessed from people. So we haven't turned around and said, this is how you should be, but these are the behaviours we're starting to identify. So for the intense person, and for every single person on this graphic, we're noticing what we call upside traits, Traits are useful when you're trading and decision making, and downside traits. So the intense person, they tend to be very passionate. They bring a lot of passion to their work. Um, and some of the outside aspects of this from a trading perspective are their fearful failure. So they invest an enormous amount of, enormous amount of energy in their work. Um, they prepare very carefully. They tend to like to be close to the screens. They like to be close to the action. Um, they're very alert for risks and opportunities. Um, they're very strong noise and flow traders. They pick up on the market signals very quickly, far more quickly than someone on the other side of the world today. Um, and this, this makes them very much highly in tune with markets and market movements. So these guys tend to be short-term traders. You know, the, the, this is where their strength is. So if they can leverage these strengths in short-term markets, in fast markets, highly volatile markets, they tend to do very well. They bring a lot of passion to their work. Some of the downside traits, though, we observe from these people are that they may tend to be overly erratic and overly self-critical. Um, they suffer from high fear of failure, uh, which can cause them to remain sometimes too much inside their own comfort zones, particularly if it's an area of the market which, which is new to them or they're in unknown territory. Um, they may dwell on bad outcomes, which can affect self-belief. and, and um, the site starts to create self-doubt, and they start, they start to doubt themselves. That's when they most need their own, uh, their own strengths. Um, and high levels of emotion can sometimes interfere with rational decision-making. Now also, you share some of the behaviours with your neighbouring types. So they will, they will share behaviours with, um, with the wary type, who tends to be highly analytical, 
and wants a lot of certainty from the market before they enter. Um, they have a strong dislike of ambiguity, which can make them hesitant and indecisive. So this can move forward into the intense type. And they share some of the characteristics of the excitable type, excitable type who can, on a negative aspect, they can have mood swings which impact their decision making. But on the more upside, um, they're very flexible, very agile, very quick to react to new information. Um, so, you know, there's lots of different aspects that are set, expected, which, which affect upside and downside. I'm not going to go through all the eight list types because, uh, you know, I think most of you would fall asleep if I did that right now. But uh, I'm going to move on to the research we've done. Um, now, what we did is we started using this tool in November 2014, and we've, we assessed roughly 80 different people from the period up to 2000, uh, November last, September last year. And what we've done is we've removed the juniors, people with less than five years' experience, because we want to just see those that we feel who have made it through boot camp, who have shown their metal and have proved consistently able to trade successfully. So we've, we've reduced that to 61 traders. Um, the majority of those are roughly 10 to 15 years' experience. Um, and out of that, we can see 26 of those are bank traders. Um, that's across eight different banks. Um, 31 of them are from hedge funds, five different hedge fund firms, uh, predominantly macro hedge fund firms. Um, there's three energy traders and one private trader in that group. And a mixed product of markets, FX, predominantly FX, um, but rates, fixed income, commodity and energy, credit and equity. So how does that look? We, how does that look when we put that on a graphic? Um, as you can see, this is the 61 traders now on this graphic. And you can see a pretty even distribution across, these are successful traders. So your risk type doesn't preclude you from being successful or unsuccessful. And we say it's not about <coughs> what you do as a trader, it's how you apply yourself to your trading that leads to your success. So everyone on here is successful in their own right as a trader. Um, what happens is we start to notice some patterns when we look, when we look at a more granular level, granular level, actually trading what they're doing. So the first thing we've done is to, to separate them into buy side and sell side. So you can see two predominant colours on here. Um, green are the, uh, the sell side traders, predominantly market makers from banks. Uh, dark blue are buy side traders, so they're the, um, the hedge fund traders. And green blue are people who are more involved in a strategic role, in a priority trading role, at a bank. So they have to be, they have to be more preemptive, they're, they're often managers um, or strategists. Some banks still have prop traders, but not in the old fence, they have prop traders who have to manage a portfolio. Um, so you start to see some patterns emerge. So the first pattern that's kind of obvious is if we look at the market makers, the non-strategic market makers, you can see they're all clustering around the top left-hand corner. As I said, the intense type, um, the wary type, and the excitable type, they're really good in fast markets. They're really good at reacting to new information very quickly. As a market maker, you have to react incredibly quickly to what happens. When a client hits you, one minute you can be long, one minute you can be short. Um, having a long-term view is not always... Um, it, you have to have a long-term view, but having too fixed a view when you're a market maker, that can really limit you. So, for example, you need to be reactive and responsive to, to the markets, to fast information. Now, we say that these people haven't necessarily chosen this role. This role was more or less chosen then. As we say, these successful people in banks, you know, often they've been in the role 20 to 25 years, and they've made a real success of market making, their ability to trade. Um, and what we've done now, the next thing, is we've removed the market makers from there. I'll just go back. As you can see, there's a few exceptions. Now, normally when there's an exception, there is a reason for it. Um, so, for example, we've got an exception of an individual who's a market maker down here. Um, very uncharacteristic, someone else around here. Um, these individuals we find are usually in, in, in market making roles, but they're different side of market making roles. They might be in an emerging market role, or an equity role, or a credit trading role where you're not just, you're more warehousing risk. 
You know, you have to be a bit more proactive and preemptive. Because if you're being asked a price in, um, in dollar Korean one, won, um, you may not get asked another price in that currency for a couple of weeks. So you have to be a little bit more proactive, you have to be at a warehouse risk, um, whereas what we're finding in the top left hand corner is much more people involved in more liquid markets. They're able to get in and out very quickly during the day. Um, and again, the green, blue, more strategic roles again, fit slightly outside that, uh, that sphere. So the next slide is we've taken out the market makers. We've eliminated them now because we just want to see what happens to discretionary people, traders. People who have to take a decision, who start out with maybe a flat book at the start of the year, and they make their own choices, their own selections. Um, so we've then looked at different aspects on a granular level of how they are as traders. So we've looked at those who are predominantly directional. We've looked at those who are predominantly have a portfolio approach, maybe a, a long short approach, um, maybe, maybe they're curve spread traders, curve traders, and then we've looked at those who are more option traders, volatility traders. And again we're starting to see some clear patterns emerging. Um, one clear pattern is we've got proprietary traders here, directional traders, who take a more long term approach. Not surprisingly, um, they're towards the lower side of the, the, uh, the slide, more purposeful, more strategic, more long term. There's another small group of proprietary traders. Um, they're not distinguishable by colour, but we know from, uh, from the work we've done with them that these guys are mostly short term traders. Um, often day traders, sometimes hour to hour traders. Um, so they're proprietary, but they're towards the upside. They have a tactical approach to trading. Um, but amalgamating them together with the directional traders, you see there is a bias towards the left-hand side of the graphic to be more, more gut feel orientated, more intuitive around their trading. When we compare that to people who are more um, spread traders, as we say, long short, portfolio, um, relative value, you can see there's a clear bias towards the right-hand side, towards more methodical, more logic-based, um, and also towards the upside, again, to be more tactical. You find these people tend to be, well, it's a mixture of strategic and tactical, but a bias towards tactical. Um, just to point out, if you're in the middle, either horizontal or vertical, you tend to be quite well balanced, able to take both uh, a mixture of approaches uh, much more easily. Uh, the next group, option volatility traders. And not surprisingly, if, you've, if, you've, if any of you have run an options book um, or a vol book inside a bank, it's you have to be methodical, really, to run that book. You tend to be very logic-based, very evidence-based. The other side of it is you tend to be more strategic. You're warehousing risk. You have to have a long-term view. It's not really a market where you go in and out too quickly. If you do, you kill the value that's within it. The value comes from people dealing with you, um, rather than you go out. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to, you're trying to hedge it, you're trying to macro-hedge it or micro-hedge it to really hold on to that value. So these guys tend to be, um, as we say, towards the lower half and very much towards the right-hand side. There are one or two exceptions here, and I will explain these as I go through. There are outliers, and they, they can be, there's some really good information in the outliers. Um, but I'm just gonna move on, well, just to point out, here's one particular outlier. Uh, now this individual, he's, uh, he works for a hedge fund. He trades options. Actually, he's struggling at the moment. And when we, look, when we took this to him, we showed this to him, he said, well, I'm in the wrong place to be an options trader. And I want to know, why were you an options trader? Why are you trading options? And he actually started out in a different hedge fund. He started at um, one, one of the largest hedge funds where he was doing execution. Now, most of the traders in his fund, um, they're, they're macro traders, um, and they use a lot of options, and they would have an idea, and they'd go up to him, and as the executor, I'd say, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I want to do, this is my long-term view, can you go out and come back with a structure for me and then execute that on my behalf? And the guy was brilliant at that. And he worked for three years doing that for these guys, and then he wanted to become a portfolio manager. But I said, no, we want you to do our, be our execution guy because you're brilliant at it. Not surprised he's brilliant at it, he's top left-hand corner. They're very good at execution. 
Anyway, they wouldn't let him become a PM. <laughs> they did everything possible to stop him becoming a PM. So he left the firm and he went to another firm and became a portfolio manager. And he thinks the way to be a portfolio manager is to manage an options portfolio, to trade options. But unfortunately for him, that doesn't work for him. That is not his skill set. That is not his risk type. So he's been struggling on that. So it's, it's interesting that we can see he's slightly misaligned. And actually, what we've got to do as a coach now is we need to work with him and perhaps guide him towards an approach that might be more suitable to his style of trading. Um, actually, this is another one. This is an options trader that I've started recently working with. So she's not on the data here. But you will find that she is also not in the right place for an options trader. And she's a very interesting story because this particular individual, uh, she worked uh, at some very large banks um, in London, New York, Tokyo, Singapore. Um, and she set up options desks and was part of that option desk for 15 years. Um, but she's completely on the other side of the scale. She's excitable. How could she be successful with options? Actually, it turns out she's a short-term option trader. And they used to call her the queen of the short dates. That was her nickname in the markets. And the reason is that when you're doing short dated options, you can't model them. They're virtually impossible to model the volatility in short dated options in one and two day and overnight options. And all the rest of the market are trying to build models of how to price a short dated option. She feels it. That's what the excitement type are. They feel the market. That side, you're intuitive. And she's brilliant. And she would be ahead of the market the whole time. So, yes, she traded options. Could she trade long-term options? No, she wasn't methodical at all. As a short-dated option, she was brilliant. So there are outliers which always kind of have a, a, a rationale behind it. Um, she's now trading for herself. Um, interestingly, having been an option trader for many years, uh, she realized that she knows nothing about trading at all. Because she's now proprietary trading, directional trading. It's not a skill set she's learned. So she's almost having to relearn to be a trader all over again. She's got all the, she understands the market, um, and she's got, like we say, she's got all the intuitive capabilities, but she's missing some of the other aspects because it was never part of her, um, her, uh, her trading. I mean, if you're an options trader, you would never know what an Elliott Wave is in a million years. Now she's learning all about Elliott Wave and all the technical side of trading. And she's going, how come I never knew this for 15 years? It just wasn't part of her, uh, her development. This is another trader, um, also the excitable type. Um, as an outlier, you see, when, when, when I actually showed you the data a minute ago, this guy was purple, so it didn't really matter. When he first responded to our questionnaire that, that goes out with the risk type compass, he, um, he, he called himself a spread trader. So it was a little bit of an outlier because spread traders don't really appear over that side very often, at least to that extreme. Um, when we started working with him, we found out actually it just happens to be a spread product. He trades it as one individual directional product. He's actually an electricity trader. So he's always trading a spread between two different products, but he trades them as one directional product. So actually, that outlier was also proved as it should have been purple. Time-wise, time frame. You can see some clear patterns here. Um, traders, short-term traders, people who say predominantly they're less than two weeks. In many cases, they're less than uh, two days. Completely over to the left-hand side. Um, if many of you are familiar with the quote by Benjamin Graham, um, in the short term, the market's a voting machine. In the long term, it's a weighing machine. What that means in the short term, it trades on people's views and opinion. In the long term, it always comes down to weight and facts. So not surprisingly, the intuitive types tend to be short-term traders over to the left-hand side. Um, and the longer term traders, they wait for weight of facts, they tend to be over to the right hand side. Um, you'll see there's some exceptions in all of these. Um, they tend to be, where, where people are denoted on the risk type, closer to the centre. And as we say, closer to the centre, you are a softer form of each type. You're more flexible, you're more able to trade other styles. Um, there's one clear example there of an outlier. Um, this guy's an individual at a hedge fund. Um, this hedge fund tends to have mostly deliberate people, and I'll show you the graphic for that hedge funds group of traders soon. This guy is an outlier, and um, yeah. what happens with him is he's got this, uh, this strategy 
It's, uh, it's a very technical strategy, it's called shit or bust. He either makes a lot of money or he loses a lot of money. And that's how it is. And every couple of years, the hedge fund stops him out and they stop him trading. But I tolerate it because every other couple of years, he makes an awful lot of money. And he nicely offsets the other style of the traders. It's a nice bit of diversity from most of the other types who are very formulaic, um, relative value, uh, methodical traders. Um, so they, they interesting from a risk management perspective that when they found, when they did this tool, the risk manager said, that completely fits in with that guy's character. And do you know what? We don't risk manage him well enough. Because had we realised that he was a very different temperament, we would have managed his risk differently. So now they've taken a different risk management approach to this individual, to everyone else. There was a blanket risk management approach across the company. Now they're saying, OK, there has to be a different strategy for this individual. And actually, it is proving quite valuable in having a different risk management approach. Um, the last category we've looked at, and this might be interesting for people here, obviously, technical analysts, we've looked at their predominant an analytical method for the markets, for how they find value in the markets. Um, here's a technical analyst. You'll notice them, not surprisingly, towards the upper side of the graphic. They tend to be more tactical. Um, also slightly to the left-hand side, um, only slightly, and obviously this is a small group, so this isn't definitive, but towards the left-hand side, they tend to be more discretionary, um, more intuitive. So they are the wary type, the intense type. Um, the next group are quantitative systematic types also tactical rather than, rather than strategic. Um, it these guys aren't too, too dissimilar to technical analysts in many respects, in that both technical analysts and the systematic types are trading off price action. It's a tactic. Um, the systematic types obviously less discretionary, not surprisingly, so they're to the right-hand side, where they tend to use more of a method, more of a logical approach. Technical analysis to the left-hand side. So actually these two are quite, quite similar. And you can see there's a, a tactical, analytical perspective towards them, towards the top half. Um, people who are more fundamentally driven, not surprisingly, there's a, a, a bit of a bias towards the lower side, towards being more strategic, more purposeful, and to the right-hand side, being more methodical. Um, the exception is that, you know, there are some on the other side there, but they are weak performers of each time. Uh, the last group is instinct-driven, and hybrid approach. Hybrid, they're using technical, they're using fundamentals, um, they're using instinct, they're using noise. Not surprisingly, these are over to the left-hand side of the graphic and bias, but not, not exclusively, towards the lower side of the graphic. So, as I said, success in trading, it's not about having the right approach necessarily, but having the right approach for you. This is the thing. We're not talking about trading psychology. We're saying you have to understand your own trading psychology. What is it that works for you? So I'm going to show some examples now. Um, the four different areas, <coughs> defensive, towards the top. We see people here who are often puzzle solvers. Think of Sudoku. They like to very quickly find some sort of glitch in the market they can identify. That can become a method or a system they make it work for themselves continually over time. Um, they don't have a long-term approach. You solve a line, then you move on and you do another Sudoku puzzle. Um, towards the lower half, purposeful strategic, they're game plays. They have a longer-term view, um, longer-term perspective on the market. Think of someone who plays chess, it's strategic. Towards the right-hand side, they will act decisively, but they need evidence before acting. They need proof. This is the methodical ones the logic-based ones. On the other side, um, these are gut field traders, capable of acting on partial evidence. Acting first, finding the facts later on. And we find some brilliant traders that are able to do that intuitively. <coughs> we also find that people, when they're in one particular time, they, don't, they see the world through their own lens. They do not understand how people on the other side of, of this graphic work. You know, I, I, I mean, Logical types who go, I just don't know how these people can make money using gut feel doesn't make sense because that's how they see the world through them and through their own eyes. Likewise, we see people on the other side 
it was like, I, I don't understand how to do that. I can't possibly hold that risk for a long time. So, uh, <coughs> now move on to one of the last graphics now, and I'm going to show four examples of four highly successful traders, um, all on different aspects of the graph, all using different type of approaches to their trading. So, um, I'm going to take the guy at the top here, uh, the guy circled here. This guy is one of the wary type, um, very anxious, very nervous. You probably think, well, maybe that is not the recipe for success in trading. This guy is the most successful guy on this particular chart as a trader. Works for a hedge fund over the last two, each of the last two years, trading short-term FX. He's made over $100 million each year for this hedge fund. Doesn't take any overnight risk. Takes no risk beyond 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Comes in with a clean slate every day. He doesn't mind putting on the risk in size because it fits his method and his approach. He's discretionary, uses technical analysis, has a system and a method that works for him. When it does that, he will put the size on, but he won't hold it for long. This guy, on the other hand, is the complete opposite to him. Likes to take a long-term position, likes to look at the market, likes to take a view, will take very big risk over a long term, often has to trade on, can run it for weeks, months even. Um, really leverages that strength. But his weakness, if you're on the other side of it, is you can be overconfident. That's what gets these people often, overconfidence. Self-belief is so high that they don't consider they can lose money. Now this individual had a very, he's had an amazing year. He's been trading for over 25 years. He's only had two losing years. One of those years was about his fifth year. It nearly wiped him out. He said, I know I'm right. And he added more and more size as the market moved further against him. He kept saying, I know I'm right. Now, actually, he was proved right about a year later. But by then, he'd been taken out. It's that old uh, Keynes phrase, the market can stay irrational for longer you can, than you can stay solvent. So after that, he had to put in some method and structure which takes him out. It doesn't matter whether he thinks he's right. He has to put a safety net in there that takes him out of the market. And he's got a few of those within his system. And that has kept him alive. But it's, yes, it's taken him out of some good positions, but more than anything, it's a money management approach and it's kept him alive over the years. Um, this side, this individual. Now this is, um, works for a bank, fixed income trader. Again, brilliant, makes an awful lot of money for the bank. Um, gets caught when the market turns. Holds on for it for too long. He waits for the evidence to come through rather than just trade off gut feel. So he could be sitting on a position for a long time, he could be adding to that position. He's, there's a lot of certainty in his approach. All the facts fit. But the actual thing is that the market changes very quickly and then often the facts follow later on. And by then he's given back half of his profit. So the upside is he'll stay with his view, doesn't have a problem with that. He'll trade around logic. He won't get knocked out by the small gyrations of the market. But he will get taken out and he will give a lot of money back at turns. And he won't recognise a turn till too late. And that works both at the start of a new move and at the end of an old move. Um, on the other side, very excitable trader. Brilliant trader. <coughs> noise trader. If he holds on to a position too long though, he's in trouble. It's not his area of speciality. Um, also likes to be proved right. Very emotional trader. Likes to be proved right. That's a big problem. He will run a trade a long way after <coughs> the money. Gets back to a short way in the money. After three months, he'll cut it out and take a profit. And you always right. So, you know, these guys are very emotional. Every one of them leverage, leverages their strength for their success. Everyone has challenges where they're weak, where they're weak, and they try and stay away from those challenges. And that's pretty much true of everyone on here, um, to different degrees. <coughs> um, very quickly, I'm going to take you through some of the team graphics. Uh, this is the hedge fund which I was mentioning. They asked us to come in and assess um, their eight top portfolio managers. They want to understand the DNA of the firm, what it is we do well, why we do it. Um, you can see they all cluster around the deliberate type with one or two exceptions. Um, this is the guy with the, um, as I told you, with the shit or bust method of trading uh, outside on the left. Um, and now they manage him very differently compared to these guys. 
He brings some nice diversity. These guys tend to have often the same risk on uh, throughout the company. So um, the company really does understand its DNA to a far greater strength. They know what they do well. As you can see, they're the logical type. Now, I know, for example, this, this company more or less got dollar yen a few years ago from 80 up to 120. They got virtually the whole move in phenomenal size. Now, when they first had the idea, when someone, I knew the individual who's an economist analyst, took the idea of them, he'd done the data, he'd done the homework, he produced a report because when they have an idea, they've got to go through thoroughly. So as soon as they got this report from this individual, they had to read the whole report before they took a position. Then they won't just have to take a position, they all had to get on a plane, fly over to Japan, meet the Ministry of Finance, meet the Bank of Japan, talk to officials, was the data in this report right? Are they seeing it correctly? Came back to London, yes, this report is right. No one else seems to have picked up on this stuff yet. This looks like a dead cert for a big move from dollar yen up. They spent a few weeks assessing all the data and all the logic behind the data before they committed themselves. Then they asked the execution guy, is very good. Can you find us a trade? How to put it on, how to express our view in the best way possible. And uh, he comes up with some option strategies. And he's more, the execution people, a little bit more involved in the tactical level with regard to their trading. But as you can see, they have to know, they have to be the evidence before they'll commit themselves to the market. Um, this was interesting because this is one individual we were working with at a bank who halfway through the coaching program disappeared to this hedge fund. We suddenly found him in this hedge fund. And we were like, myself and my colleague began, why are they hiring him? He's completely the wrong risk type for them. This was a gamble. Yep, they had one guy who was over there who was different. But this guy is polar opposite to them. And actually within three months he blew up and he didn't last very long. So they had to clear up a mess. It wasn't that he wasn't capable, he was a brilliant trader at the bank doing what he was doing. He went for the wrong hedge fund for them. It wasn't his style, it wasn't their style. A different hedge fund, very successful over the last two years, some great returns. One of the top performing macro, macro funds in 2014. Um, not quite as strong in 2015, but still good performance. They have a different DNA, diverse, different approaches. They've got the FX trade, they take the day approach. They've got guys who are long term, more risk seeking. It's interesting for them to know their DNA and their risk management, understand it, and they don't have the same approach for everyone in the company to risk. There is a general approach, but they look at everyone differently. Um, this was a bank I worked at, very successful team, emerging rates team. Um, I'm going to move on quickly because I don't want to hold on to this too long. But you can see the different characteristics, they blended brilliantly to form a really good team. Strong risk taker and leader at the bottom, uh, very strong detail, analytical guy at the top, cautious, um, would, rate, would, rate, would rein in the guy at the, bottom, at the bottom on risk, and then someone who's very good on a bit more moderate on risk, very reactive to the markets, very in tune with the markets, very good liquidity manager. Um, I'll just, that pretty much covers it. Um, I'm going to have to take some Q&As now. Uh, questions from anyone, anything may have thought, anyone who may have thought of anything at all. Um, so feel free to fire away. Yes. A um, couple of points, if I may. Um, you mentioned a woman trader once. <laughs> um, are there not enough women traders to actually do a statistical, to, to do a study on? I'm surprised, you know, the, 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 the assumption is that traders are men. And, uh, There's only two women traders in this group. Right. So, so, so these, yeah. we just, we just, we, we're going with the clients of ours because they're going to their traders. <coughs> we're just working what they've given to us. So, there are, we, we, I personally am involved in a couple of um, cultural diversity initiatives with banks to help improve their female involvement in trading. Um, we've had talent managers coming to us saying we can't hold on to our female talent. Um, we'd like more female talent, we'd like to diversify the talent within our group. Um, there is a strong, um, there's quite a lot of research to say that women traders actually do better than men traders in some situations. Yes. So, well, I was thinking that because um, I'm a private trader and yeah. amongst the, the private traders there is always the assumption that the women do not trade as frequently as the men. That's, yeah. that's, that's a broad assumption. But, yes. 
it would be interesting to see some uh, studies on that kind of thing. It would be interesting because, as I mentioned, the woman trader is on the other side, and she yeah. she over trades massively, and she says she does. Yeah. And that's yeah. one of her biggest problems. Yeah. So, is it possible that actually the women traders being attracted to this job may be towards the right hand side, um, the logical side? So I went to I went to a, a women's only lunch. It wasn't women's only because I was invited. But it was a, a women in the city lunch, and they had Nicola Horlick speaking there. And uh, I mean, I'm sure you know from Nicola Horlick, uh, a fantastic investment manager, one of the top investment managers in the country. And she was talking about just this issue. And she was saying a lot of women actually, the market kind of filters some of them out. They don't, you know, the emotion that's involved in this actually forces a lot of women voluntarily leave. Um, so I, I just wonder, and I don't know the answer, but are the women that are staying over towards the more methodical side, more logical side, they're trading less, and they involve more investment? We, we just don't know, there's just not enough research about that. But I mean, I'd love to, you know, it, it is, you know, I've got two daughters and I feel that, you know, women don't always get a fair share in this business. So. Sorry, you had a question? Yes, thank, thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. Now, I'm curious, um, given all the research that you've done, given all the people that you've coached, yeah. do you find that there are some successful traders out there that have more than one predominant style? So, for example, you might have some traders who are quite active on a short-term or an intraday basis, yeah. and at the same time, they can perform very well at longer-term trading. Now, and trading and investing. Now the reason I ask that is because if you've got more than one style, you'll naturally then fall onto more than one point on that risk spectrum. So I'm quite curious to know, you know, how many traders, are, traders and investors are there out there that have more than one style? Yeah, it's an interesting question you ask. As I said, the closer you are to the axis on here, the more you're able to, 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 to evolve, to have different styles. So there's one individual I've coached at a bank who's trades both short term and long term and he's been very successful both he, he, he's a market maker and he takes priority positions and he not surprisingly is this individual here he's right in the middle of the axis he, he's a bit of a jack of all trades and what we try to do is to make him a master at two different things both at market making and, and trading liquidity and uh, priority trading and taking a longer term view we've actually had to say what you've got to do is actually, rather than amalgamate these two together, separate them out, have different hats for each. And, and the thing he found that in his market making, he can run a huge risk overnight. $200 million is no problem for him on an FX position. But his prop positions are no more than five or $10 million. And he, he, was mixing them, he was mixing the two of them up a little bit too much before. And by separating them out, he's actually become very successful at both. Um, but he is, it's almost like he's got the perfect makeup to do that. Now, if we take the individuals at the edge, um, that's very hard for them to do. But as we say, you can actually mix both. Um, again, this individual, so this individual here, so I'm going to highlight him. He's another one. He, he's able to take a, have a longer term strategic view and to trade tactically short term. So when I met him in November, um, he was telling me about his cable position. He said, um, I'm, I, think, I think cable's going down to 140. I said, so how are you positioned now? I'm long. It was 151 at the time. So I said, OK, so you know, explain that to me, what you're thinking is there. He said, well, short term, I think it's going to bounce between 150 and 153 for a while. So I keep buying at 150, selling at 153. So the moment 150 goes, I'm all short. He goes, I'm big short down to 140. So he's had that long-term position, he's run it, but he's also to trade around it. He's got a real skill being able to trade around it. And the other irony is that he can't take a position if he doesn't have a position. Being a market maker and having done so many years, he has to wait for a customer to put him into a position, and then he'll trade around it. And he did a couple of years where he went prop trading for a bank a few years ago, and he didn't know how to start his day. So he used to sit there, he said, and I had no edge. He said, once I got hit, I could either decide to stay with it or not. It was a strange mindset, but the mindset was so heavily into market making. But he was a prop trader as well, but only around his market making. But he had a strategic view and was able to trade technically. And as you can see, he's quite close to the axis, so he has that ability to be able to do both. So, any, yes? Um, what is 
Okay, so right, how I use it is an individual takes the questionnaire, um, they have another psychometric assessment as well, which is a more broader personality assessment, and I ask them to complete a questionnaire about their training as well at the same time. I then go back and I feed this back to the individual. And then as a coach, then we have a series of uh, six sessions, uh, sometimes it's eight sessions, which are really just meetings and discussions over an extended period of eight to ten months. Sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, depending on the need. And we explore their trading in, um, in, in, a, in a kind of co-creational, is the word we use, co-creational process, to help them understand themselves more. They're revealing information about their trading that hasn't come out so far. We're exploring that. I'll challenge them in areas. Um, I'll bring in examples from other areas, from my own experiences, from other tradings. They were having a hard moment. And it becomes a series of a hard moments as we go through the coaching. They go away, they try something new. So the coaching is actually trying to bring behavioural change. The awareness comes in the early part of the coaching. The behavioural change comes in the later stages. But the awareness carries on all the way through. And in a sense, it carries on throughout your career. So I'm still having these awareness moments for myself. Um, many, many years after I had my first experience of coaching back in 2001, when I got to know myself more. And the important thing is, can you, once you know yourself, you start thinking, okay, do you know what? I understand why I'm doing that. I understand why I'm not good at that. Let's stay away from the areas I'm not good at. Or if I'm going to do that, let's do it in a way that's, that's helpful for me. So as a trader, I was very short term. Um, and I could take good size risks short term. I, I was the intense type. Um, I wasn't a very good longer term trader. I couldn't hold risk for very long. I can hold longer term risk, but I have to do it in smaller size. That fits me. That way I don't get pushed in and out of the market so much. I don't get pulled by the, by the noise of the market. But I'm a very good noise trader. That's what I work off and I use my technical analysis, I use my fundamental knowledge in the market, and I bring it together and I used to leverage that in short-term trades, sometimes day trades, sometimes for a week or two. Um, but I would be in, I would get out, and I wouldn't stay in there. And I would go in in size because I could use that. That was, where, that was my comfort zone. That was where I was good at. So I think becoming more aware of who you are, what your proclivities are, the things you do badly, um, the things you do well. Um, and what is the reason behind it? What is the underlying reason behind it? That's how you can then start to improve your trading. It starts to make its incremental small differences that actually add to very, very big differences in the end. At the end of the day, we're talking about, you know, 50, most traders, you know, 50-50 success rate. It's not very far off, but you lose money if you've got 50-50 success rate because you're paying away spread. So you probably have to be making money 51% of the time. But you're not making very much. If you go to 52%, you're starting to make quite a bit of money. 53%, you're in the realms are very successful. It's, we, we've run some, um, some scenarios on that, and I think we found that I think 57% equated to about 30% return a year. And I think we, we found that 53% daily performance probably equated to the sort of returns Bridgewater Capital would be making if you aggregated them over 30 years, and they're the most successful hedge fund in the world. So it's it is fine margins, and if you can make those small differences, they actually start to add up to big differences in the end. So, yes? Sorry, can you expand a little bit on why human beings aren't so changeable? You said that it's like a ship. You can move a little bit from where your fundamental uh, behaviour is, yeah. but over time, it does really move. I mean, why is that? Right. It's why are we stuck in this... Uh, Stamp from birth or whatever. Right. Well, truth is I don't know. Mm -hmm. And truth is no one knows. It, it's that nature versus nurture debate. But what it is, is that we're pretty fully formed in our early years. And it's a mixture of nature and nurture. Uh, we're not sure how. Um, I, I like to think of it like athletics. Um, if you're tall um, and powerful, you're more likely to be a sprinter. If you're smaller, and more alive, you're more likely to be a long-term distance runner. Now, no one knows necessarily why you've developed that way. It's partly your DNA, partly your genes. Um, Karma. Sorry? Karma. <laughs> um, you know, it, 
it, it's almost the same physically. We have the men, we have we have these mental sciences. Yeah, well, if you're puny, you can go to the gym or, and, and work out. I'm sure you can do the same with your mind to some extent. You well, the theory is that you can't change risk type. You can change your behaviours. You can change your attitudes, but your risk type is anchored. Um, you might be able to change a little bit over time, but you're never going to be very far from where you are. You, you know, there is evidence that people moderate over time. They become, as they become older, they become more mature. Um, you might move in a little bit to the uh, to the centre, but that's a theory. We don't actually know that, um, but that is that's what's suggested out there. Um, and again, you might, you know, I, I think the truth is that you're denoted by a circle here, but in reality, you're probably within a broader area around that circle, but not very far from that. So we don't know why people are like that, but what we are finding is that when they do this test, then when we meet the individuals, they pretty much fit in with the characteristics from the test. And actually, I, I asked the people who complete the questionnaire at the same time, without telling them what it means, you know, oh, do you think you're this type, this type, or this type? And often they come out very close to their type. So we, we don't know the answer to that. But uh, risk personality does seem to be anchored. So. Cool. By the way, this is used in lots of other domains. It's used in sport, um, high performance sport. It's been tested on lots of different professions, um, airline pilots, um, uh, air traffic controllers, policemen, auditors. And you know the same sort of clusters of patterns are showing up there as well. So yes, yeah. I'll come to you next. It's technically possible uh, to be in a specific uh, situation, uh, a type, uh, and uh, in other uh, situations uh, you are totally switched to another type. What, what, right? Despite the opposite of uh, just a different type. I think when people aren't under pressure, they behave in different ways. This is looking at how people are really when they're kind of under pressure, when they have to make high risk decisions. That's what we're looking at. So you might recognize that in your trading, and I certainly have recognized it in my trading over the year, when I go, okay, um, I'm looking at the market in the morning, yeah, I definitely want to be long here, get long, and I get to the end of the day and I'm wondering why I'm short. Something happened during the day when the emotions came in and I started doing stupid things. And at the end of the day, I'm going, what was I thinking? What was I doing? Usually I use a bit more colourful language in that. And I start beating myself up. It, it's, it's that difference between when you're in a calm, rational state yep. and when you're in an emotional state. And these are really about how people, you know, how people work in emotional states. So, um, just looking here at the composed type, these people very calm and composed. Um, nothing really flusters them. You know, I was talking to one individual recently, coaching him, who told me of an incident on the way in to work where someone challenged him. He rides in his bike into work. Um, he was going up a hill. The guys in the white van started hooting him. I'm going to go at him because he was going too slowly. They got to the traffic lights. The guy in the van jumped out, started to say, I'm a Taekwondo expert, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and he just looked at him and he went, so you're going to kill me for driving too slow. And so sort of totally disarmed the guy, and he just walked off and he went, oh, I'm going to kill you next time. <laughs> and he went into the office and he told the guys in the office what happened. He just sort of happened to mention the story a week later or so. Now he works with a lot of guys who are on the other side. They're all intense, passionate types. And they're going, how did you remain calm in that situation? How are you so calm? He said, just that. Just, that is just how he is. That's his natural personality. That what makes, that's what makes him really good. On the other hand, he can be too calm and composed sometimes. Sometimes you need to be fast in the market, you need to be too reactionary, you know, you need to respond to things. And at the end of the day, you can be sitting there long, completely underwater, because he hasn't responded to the noise. In the, he doesn't pick up on that noise where there's so much signals, so many signals, that these other guys do. So, you know, there's plus sides, there's minus sides to everything. But this is the natural state of people when they're under pressure. And that's what we say, if you can start to understand what you're like. So, you know, the intense type, really good short-term traders. They do get into a mess like everyone else, but they'll react quickly. They won't let themselves get 
pull too far. They'll come, and then they'll get back in tune with the market. Not always, but their behavior is suited for that sort of volatility, and they're really good at it quite often. So, yeah, sorry, you had a question. Thanks, thanks. Um, if you're sort of aware where you sit on that uh, personality type, uh, uh, asset class, or where you sit there, Further to what the person at the front was saying, is there further text or resource that you can look at if you're a personal trader not looking to get a life coach or you know, a trading coach to, to sort of find out more about it that you can recommend? At the moment, I mean, the tool is, it can only be used by people who have gone through the program and who have sort of studied with the, it's, it's a two-day course and they charge 1,400 pounds. Um, and then once you're licensed to use it, you have to go through a debrief process with the individual. It's not that you just send it out. I am in talks with them about creating something, some sort of product, where, because the actual report itself wasn't necessarily targeted for traders. It's a general risk analysis across all industries. So the language, we talk about upside traits, downside traits, main proclivities. They have another aspect which they use for risk attitude, which I don't use in this test which separates people out from where they're more likely to take risks. Is it health and safety? Is it, um, is it financial? Is it recreational? Is it social? That, to me, doesn't really <coughs> echo much in my work with traders. I just want to look at this, this element. And there's another aspect on an index called the risk tolerance, risk tolerance index, uh, which scores people from zero to 100. Um, and interestingly, um, this individual at the top on the risk tolerance index is the lowest individual we've ever measured on risk tolerance. Um, but generally we find that traders on this side with low risk tolerance seem to mediate up. It's quite hard to explain, but the average wary type across the entire country, they, they, so they've done it on 10,000 population, tends to have a risk tolerance index of about 13. But the average trader who's wary we find has a risk tolerance of 27. So traders tend to moderate up when they're on the upper side they become more capable of taking risk. And on the other side, these people tend to moderate downwards. So we don't find anyone who's successful as a trader with risk tolerance above 80. They're just too dangerous as risk takers. They're going to get taken out by the market once too often. Um, so we find that the average, um, that the most risk seeking is the adventurous type. The average adventurous person, I think, in the country would have a, a risk tolerance of about 87. Amongst traders, the average trader with an adventurous type has a risk tolerance of 73. So we find they're moderating down, that they're actually um, taking steps to become less adventurous almost, to achieve success. Um, and this kind of fits in with, with what we're seeing, that successful traders, they know what they're doing well, and they leverage those strengths, but they know what they do badly, they know what their weaknesses are, and they either take steps to moderate that, or they do stuff to stay away from those areas where they're weak. And that kind of like starts to tip the balance, as we say, between success and failure. So, um, I come back to me, and I, I, love, I spoke to you about that as well, Alex. Alex can, you know, I'm gonna talk about that with you as well, what we can do in this area. So, because I have had requests from, from before as well. So, um, shall I hand it over to you now? I don't know if you have any more questions. Well, in any case, um, I hope you have enjoyed this uh, presentation by Steve Goldstein. Um, I must admit, I certainly did myself. And I hope we will be seeing you again at the next chapter.